So I've been in this message series talking about things like eternity, judgment day, the second coming. Um, and today I'm supposed to finish this portion up on talking to you about the crowns that we receive, the rewards that we receive uh, in heaven. And um, so I want to talk to you about that today. And I want to give you a little disclaimer before I start taking off on this thing. And that disclaimer is this. Oh. You all right? <laughs> Sorry, Keith. It's all right. I think it's all right. He c Craig can fix it. You have a broken guitar, Craig can fix that thing for sure. Probably make it better than it was before. So because of some of the things I preach about at church and because of my style of preaching, because I get a little passionate, sometimes people um, misunderstand me as a uh, uh, legalistic, hard-lined preacher. Um, and I, I just want you to understand that I'm, I'm really far from being legalistic, okay? But let me tell you what I am. I'm about the gospel, and I'm about preaching the truth. And I believe that God's word is our main and only source of truth. I really do believe that. And there's a lot in the word of God that we have yet to really uh, teach and talk about in church as a whole. Because we gravitate towards things that really um, uh, just kind of touch us emotionally and make us feel happy. And I want to tell you that there's nothing better than the sobering truth that gives you the power and the tools you need to get through so, so many of life's disasters. Okay? And that's more important than trying to uh, create a comfortable experience um, so that you come to church for the wrong reason. So we got a lot of churches, and some of them big ones, and they're big. And, and there's a lot, but they're for the wrong reason. And we're, we're, we're not into the consumer Christianity because it kills people. It hurts people. It really does. It's causing a lot of problems, especially today. You know, we have this pandemic or this pandemic, however you want to see it. And, um, and people are being totally uh, being ransacked and overcome and being hurt and betrayed by fear. And um, a lot of people don't, it's like they don't have the faith to withstand what's going on. And the reason why is because if you're not, if you're not teaching and preaching what needs to be taught and preached, then folks won't have what they need to get through the everyday life kind of stuff, okay? I'm not, I mean... No slam on certain people and all that. I'm not trying to call other, other preachers out. But y your best life is not now. Your best life is in heaven. Okay? That's where your best life is. How you, how you have peace and how you have joy and how you have excitement for every day in the midst of trouble has nothing to do with um, any of that kind of stuff. It has everything to do with your faith and your rest being in your relationship with Jesus. Okay? That's where it's found. You, you are able to overcome the little and big things of life because of your faith in God, not because of these, you know, buy my book and there's seven principles you need to apply and for fifty nine ninety five, it, you know, it'll change your life or, you know, speak to the kingdom money and tell it to get in your wallet and all that kind of stuff. I'm not into that stuff. Matter of fact, none of that stuff has ever saved anybody from hell. So... Only Jesus. So I want to I wanna quickly tell you about these five crowns. Uh, so I'm going to kind of, at first service, I kind of went through this a certain way. I'm changing it up for second service, okay? So I just want to give you these five crowns real quick. Now, a as I do, I want you to understand something. Remember that we will all be judged according to works and deeds and motivations, so you must make sure that your motivations are pure as I'm talking to you about these crowns, okay? Our motivations must be pure as to why we do the deeds that we do. We don't believe that you are saved by works. We believe you are saved by grace. 
but the works that we do are an expression of the work that he's already done inside of us. Does that make sense? Okay, so we do the good works and we do the good deeds because it brings glory and honor to God and it also opens the door for evangelism to be able to reach people where they're at in their life. Amen? So, for example, I don't know if you know this, but we have a third service now on Saturdays. That's been going on for some time. Matter of fact, it has been thriving and growing since the pandemic. And every Saturday here at 10 o'clock a.m., there are food boxes that are being gathered by folks in the community. And my wife, Monica, and other volunteers who faithfully serve in this ministry, on Wednesdays, they go grab the food, they bring it here to the church. On Saturdays, they get here by 8 in the morning, and they set up the tables and the chairs and the food and the drinks and, and, and bring it all from downstairs up here, and they have church. My wife preaches a 10-minute sermon, and she prays with everybody, and they have already seen lives get changed, miracles happen, m miracles of deliverance and healing in, in the Saturday morning service, Amen. right? See, because you, you, can't, you can't say it's not a church service just because it doesn't look like this. Yes. You, you should know that the Americanized way of doing church is not really worldwide, only in your little world is it like that. It ain't like that everywhere else. And the gospel's being shared and lives are being changed. Seeds are being dropped. There's people who are from the streets, from the trail, people who have low income or no income. And there's people just like you and me that need some food because they need some more money in their budget to be able to afford gas to go to work. So we don't judge anybody. We just say, if you want some food, come. Are they looking for volunteers? Yep. They sure are. Faithful ones, not flaky ones. Listen, you don't change anybody's life by being a flake. You don't. You be consistent, and you do it for the kingdom. You're not doing it for Monica. You're not doing it for Alpha. You're doing it for Jesus. You do it for the king, and you stay committed to what God has called you to do. This is all going to make more sense after I finish the sermon today. But I want you to know God is moving in a strong way. It has nothing to do with how many people decide to come to church on Sunday, how many followers are on Facebook and YouTube right now. It has nothing to do with that. Our focus is not on the amount of people. Our focus is on the people that God has brought, that everybody live for Jesus every day the way that Jesus says to do it. And a lot of these messages are not popular. They're not the kind of messages you preach when you want to flood your church with new people. But I remember Jesus said something that was really weird. He said, eat my flesh and drink my blood if you want to be my followers. And he got rid of a lot of fans that day. And he looked at his 12 and he said, are you guys going to leave me too? And Peter said, where else will we go? Because you hold the words of life. And that's what I need. I don't know about you, but I need the words of life planted inside of me. Amen. Patty, it's good to see you. Come on. Of course, Tom and Michelle, it's good to see you too. But Patty's in the house. She's been fighting with cancer. Actually, I think cancer's been fighting with her. Because she has not given up on her faith. She has been determined to shine the light of Jesus with everybody in her family and everyone who comes around her, and we've been praying for her, and it's just a walking testimony that she's here right now because they told you you were going to be gone a long time ago. What, three years ago? And look at you. Still, still giving glory to God. Praise God. So the Bible talks about five, um, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about five different crowns that are mentioned in the Bible, okay? And um, I want to give them to you really quick, and I'll give you some scripture reference. That way, if you don't believe me, you can read the scripture and find out for yourself, which everybody should do anyway, right? So the first one is called the crown of victory. The crown of victory. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize, so run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not shadow boxing. 
I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. 1 Corinthians 9, 25. The prize to which Paul refers is a crown. This crown is reserved, reserved for those who through careful discipline have overcome the desires of the flesh. Through the means of the Holy Spirit, they have managed to gradually wane themselves from the power of the temptations of this world, just as an athlete trains to perfect his performance in an athletic contest. Christians must train themselves to overcome the desires of the flesh. Church, can I ask you, are we supposed to overcome the desires of our flesh? We're supposed to walk after the... Okay, three of you know it. We're supposed to walk after the... And not after the... Okay, amen. Well, there, there are some... There are some that will be recognized because they have killed the flesh. I don't know if I'm receiving that crown. Because sometimes I feel like my flesh has won a lot more than the spirit. But not because the spirit is weak, but because alpha is weak sometimes. And so are you. Don't look at me crazy. Just because I'm up here and you're down there, you're not off the hook. But honestly, it's something that the Bible mentions. It's a crown that's given. And, you know, I think of some of the friends that I've known through the years, especially missionaries, who they honestly, man, I, I feel like I'm standing next, like, next to Jesus in the flesh when I'm with them. They have, they have given up everything. They have killed their flesh to completely follow after Jesus. Separated themselves from the world in any worldly thing. Any worldly thing. Just to glorify God. Not to put judgment on anybody else, not to act like they're better than anyone else or they're, they're more of a Christian than anyone else, but because they just are that sold out to walking with Jesus and they want no other distraction, nothing else. There's also the crown of rejoicing. And the crown of rejoicing, um, Philippians 4.1, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. I love you and long to see you, dear friends, for you are my joy and the crown I receive for my work. After all, what gives us hope and joy and what will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before our Lord Jesus when he returns? It is you. Yes, you are our pride and joy. First Thessalonians 2, 19 through 20. This crown that the Apostle Paul is talking about is the crown that has to do with souls being saved. Souls being saved. Because you know what? God wants to use you to bring people into relationship with Jesus Christ. And every soul that gets saved because you allowed God to use you, the Lord is going to reward you and give you credit on that day. He is going to rejoice and be glad with you because there will be people standing with you in heaven because you let Jesus use you to bring them into relationship with him. Amen? There's the crown of righteousness. And now... The prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. This crown is reserved for people who are living their life looking for Jesus. And I believe that my grandmother has this crown. My grandmother would remind me often she would say, Jesus is coming back for those who are looking for him. There are some people on this earth that they're so focused on the kingdom of heaven, you can't help but have the kingdom stuff get all over you when you're around them. They're focused on the kingdom of heaven. Even Paul, Paul said, what, he said, I've been to the third heaven. And he said, I didn't want to come back. He said, I only came back for your sake. Because God was not finished with him yet here on the earth. If it was up to him, he would have stayed. Heaven is a great place. And when we get there, there is going to be a judgment and reward ceremony. 
Just because a lot of people don't talk about it doesn't mean it's not true. Read your Bible. It's true. It will happen. And it will be a great day for those who are saved. It's a terrifying day for those who don't know the Lord. But it is a great day for those who are saved. If you're saved, you shouldn't be afraid of that day. You should be looking forward to that day. You should be excited about that day. There's something called the crown of life. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation because afterward they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. James, uh, I'm sorry, James 1.12. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days, but if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. Revelation 2.10. You see, in the Bible, it says the crown of life. What is the crown of life? It is given to anyone who was willing to endure persecution, testing, and even death for the gospel. Anyone who was willing to put their life on the line to serve Jesus. Anyone who did not deny him when they were threatened with their life. You know, the Bible does say, if you deny me, I will deny you. And there's the crown of glory. And now a word to you who are elders in the churches. I too am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ. And I too will share in his glory when he is revealed to the whole world. As a fellow elder, I appeal to you, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly. Not for what you will get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. And when the great shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. What does this crown have to do with? It has to do with those who have remained faithful to do what God has called them to do for the kingdom, like shepherding a flock, discipling a group, discipling people that God has brought their way. Okay, people who are in a position of authority and a position of influence who have done what they do in the name of the Lord. Amen? For the increase of the kingdom, taking care, being concerned with the spiritual condition of the people that God has placed in front of them. There's a crown that will be given to you for that. So now I've given you the crowns. Now I want to preach this message I have prepared for you. Okay, you guys with me? I told you at the beginning that we are judged according to words, deeds, and actions. And I want you to never forget that. Okay, we're judged according to words, deeds, and actions. Paul said, For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body, 2 Corinthians 5.10. I would encourage you to take notes so that you can jot these scriptures down and read them later. Jesus said, and I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak, Matthew 12.36. That means I really do have to watch my mouth. My mom and my grandmother has been telling me forever to watch my mouth. And you know what? They were right. Jeremiah proclaimed this, But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. Jeremiah 17.10 Did the Bible use the word rewards? Yes. And it does more than once. More than twice, more than five times, more than ten times in the Bible. For the time has come for judgment, and it must begin with who? God's household. 
And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news? And also, if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to godless sinners? 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 17 through 18. Did you see what the Bible said? The Bible says that. You, don't, you can't blame that on a denomination. You can't blame that on uh, Revolution Church's doctrine or theology. You can't, you can't blame that on Pastor Alpha. The Bible says that. And if the Bible says that, that means we need to pay attention to it. That means we need to understand that God is saying something to us. It says, barely saved. And judgment will start with the house of God. Well, thank you, Lord, for letting us know. Thank you, Lord, because now that you've let us know, we can get our hearts right and prepare for that judgment day. That's part of the good news. You know, there's something called the gospel, and there's something called uh, the American gospel, and there's something called the full gospel. At Revolution Church, we purpose to be a full gospel church, okay? The fate of those who reject Christ is eternal separation from Him. But those who embrace Him, we can face His judgment with fearless confidence. Okay. We can face him with confidence if we have lived our earthly lives like Jesus has called us to. Jesus calls us to be like him. And many of us miss the mark on that one. But it is something that we are to strive to do, is to live like Jesus and less like us. Amen? More like him, less like us. Aren't you glad that you aren't who you used to be when you didn't know Jesus? I thank God, and you know what? People around me should thank God that I am not who I am before Jesus. Come on. You think COVID has changed your life? You better think about what Jesus has done in your life. Amen? Come on. If anything, you know what? Can I theory on COVID? Are you ready? Oh, I'm, I'm online and everything. Let me tell you what my theory is on COVID is that God wants to line up his church with the Holy Ghost. That God wants to line up his church with the Holy Ghost. He has caused a little shaking so that the unshakable things could be revealed. The unshakable things could remain. People who value church for the experience and not value church for what church is supposed to be about. People who created churches for other reasons than the kingdom, God is shaking it all up. And you know what? Some of us need to thank God because it has brought us to a different place personally in our walk with God that needed to be firmed up. Amen? Amen. Now, I can't, I I don't want to get into it on all these different things about COVID. I can tell you my my personal opinion. I I joke around about stuff, so I think you guys kind of know where I'm at with it. But I'll tell you this. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. I don't think that we should be ignorant or dumb, but I don't need to live in fear. And you don't need to live in fear either. So I believe that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And I've seen time and time again, and I've seen it in the Bible, where the enemy tries to do something to bring destruction, and God uses it to bring refining. You see, so God will take something like this, and he'll refine people, and the enemy will use it to destroy people. But I don't think that God was surprised by COVID at all. I don't think that God you know, woke up one day because he doesn't sleep, so he didn't wake up one day. But I don't think he woke up one day and said, oh, my goodness, there's COVID on the earth. Wow, 
What are we going to do about this? If anything, I believe that God looked at the church and he said, I wonder what the church is going to do about this. How are they going to handle this? How's the church going to handle COVID? As we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. 1 John 4, 17. Let me tell you this. There will be absolutely no fear in heaven. Judgment is reserved for Christ. You know that Jesus is our ultimate judge. We are not good at his position. You know, you know that, right? We are not good at being judges. We think we are. We like to practice it quite a bit. But we're not very good at it because we don't have the righteousness that Jesus has. He is the righteous judge. Jesus, let me, let me tell you what kind of judge he is. He's the one that expended his life to serve others, preaching the gospel, healing those in need, washing his disciples' feet, and giving his life on the cross in order to save all. Jesus walked a humble and selfless road, and he calls us to do the same. God does not want us to live like Pharisees. He doesn't want us to live like religious people who are concerned with the outside, but not the inside. Pharisees focus on image. They focus on popularity. They focus on position and entitlement. Pharisees cared more about the outside. Jesus addressed them about the inside. It says, so don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time before the Lord returns. For he will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. Then God will give to each one whatever praise is due. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether it was good or evil. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will confess and give praise to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. Romans 14, 10 through 12. And brothers and sisters, when it talks about causing someone to fall, we're not just talking about what you choose to drink and what you choose to eat. We're talking about what comes out of your mouth. The Bible talks about it's not what goes in the mouth that defiles a man, but that which comes out of the mouth defiles a man. Remember, the book of James tells us that the mouth has done more damage than any other part of the body. God help us. How many people have walked away from the church because of things that have come out of the mouth? How many people won't go to church because of things that have come out of the mouth? We should approach everyone with the same humility that Christ exhibited. Because we never know what role others will play in the eternal kingdom. The one you look down on today might be standing next to you in eternity. The one you look down on today might be over you in the new heaven and new earth. Jesus talked about that too. Didn't he say, the least shall be great and the great shall be least? Not everyone will have the same position or status in heaven. 
Don't fall for the myth that everyone will enjoy equal standing because it's not true. Although God loves each of us without end, some will be given positions of higher authority and responsibility than other people. So, if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5.19 But many who seem to be important now will be the least important then. And those who are considered least here will be the greatest then, Matthew 19, 30. When you read further in your Bible, you read and you see things like where Jesus addressed his apostles and he told them, surely when you come into the kingdom of heaven, you will be over cities. You'll be given a place of authority. Listen, what you're doing with your life right now you can look at it as training ground for how you will spend your eternity in the new heaven and new earth. Doesn't the Bible say, wake up, O sleeper? Because we like to sleep. The church has been sleeping on what, and the whole time the devil has been going to work. We're, we're complaining and putting the blame on politicians when the church has been wrapped up in consumer Christianity and hasn't been praying and hasn't been leading like it's supposed to. And now I hear these words about a remnant. I wish there didn't have to be a remnant. There didn't, I wish there didn't have to be. I wish that there was more who wanted God and wanted to serve God than not. But this is the world that we live in. Taking, taking a backseat approach on our position of faith and power. That time needs to be over. We do not need to be the smaller percentage. They've been talking about the smaller percentage since I was in high school. They told us when I was in high school that if people didn't reach, uh, if people didn't get saved by the time they were age 18, if they didn't get saved, that only 4% of that generation would come to the Lord. And let me tell you something, people acted like, ah, whatever, uh, you know, whatever, we just keep doing our Christian thing, doing our church thing. Guess what? Guess what? Look at where we're at today. Look at where we're at today. Somebody says, you hurt my feelings because you talk about Jesus, and people say, okay, I guess I won't talk about him. What is wrong? What is wrong with the church today? What is wrong with us today? That all it takes is for somebody to badmouth us and we act like our head is getting chopped off. And we stop doing the Lord's work because we're so concerned about what everybody has to say. We need to be more concerned about what Jesus has to say. We are more concerned about how we feel in churches instead of how the Holy Ghost feels in churches. We say, oh man, we need to create this comfortable community and we put fancy names on it and we use we use uh certain terms that i won't use because i don't want other pastors to think that i'm slamming them because i'm not we use coin phrases and terms and slogans and all of these things and do it in the name of trying to draw people to come to church listen the holy ghost needs to be the main draw to church Okay? The demonstration of the works of God that was in the Bible that is still relevant today needs to be the main attraction for why people come to church. People shouldn't come to church because it looks so pretty and because the music is just like this and the preacher's like that and they give you this stuff and they give you that stuff and they start at this time and they end sharply on that time. You're never going to have to miss your football game. We should not come to church for those reasons. We should come to church because we are are hungry and we are attracted to the presence of God and we see the value of being the body of Christ. There was a time where the church moved politics and politics didn't move church. If you look in history, there was a time. There was a time where cities and countries were greatly influenced by the church. And then the church got crooked. And got all about the money. The same stuff Jesus addressed. And here we are today. 
But we don't have to sit there and complain about it and get all upset about it and not do anything. What we're supposed to do is get kingdom-minded and get kingdom-focused. And what we're supposed to do is be about the Father's business in the way that God has called you to be involved. Because some people are supposed to be preachers. Some people are supposed to be doctors. Some people are supposed to have landscape businesses. Some people are supposed to hang sheetrock. Some people are supposed to do electrical work. Some people are supposed to work for the city. Some people are supposed to work in politics. Some of you are supposed to be lawyers. You're supposed to be judges. See, God has called everybody, has created everybody for a specific purpose. And whatever he put you on this earth to do is just as important as what Billy Graham did. Is just as important as what Luis Palau did. Doing what you were put on this earth to do is the main thing. And it's not supposed to be a difficult discovery. When I'm looking for something, I look hard until I find it. You ever, you ever send somebody, you know, I, I almost said my kids, but I, I don't want to put them on blast. But you ever send somebody to go look for something in the fridge? Hey, will you go get the sour cream? Where is it? There is no sour cream. You only look for a half a second. But when you want the sour cream, you're like moving the shelf, moving stuff. There's some sour cream in here somewhere. My goodness, I better find that sour cream or somebody's going to the store right now. But see, when you want to find something, you move everything until you find it. You see what I'm saying? We say, oh, what does God call me to do? How much effort have you put into finding out? Oh, I've just been too busy paying bills. Okay, that's excuse number one. What else you got? Because everybody's got to pay bills. I hate that excuse. You know why? Because I, I tried to use that one. And if the Lord didn't let me get away with it, why should you get away with it? I'm telling you, God called, God called us to pastor this church, to plant a church and pastor this church, and I tried to tell God, well, you, may, you better pay me so I don't have to work another job. You need to pay me enough money so I don't have to do two jobs and pastor the church because I'm already wore out of that. And man, the Holy Ghost had to straighten me out. But, but he gave me what I needed to do it. Listen, I, I've told this story before. I'm telling you, the presence of God showed up in my room so much that it changed the color of my room. You don't have to believe me. It's my story, my testimony. Go get your own. <laughs> he changed my life that day. He changed my perspective. He changed my heart. He took away the fear of not having enough. My family, we love to give. Because we just see God do miracles with it over and over again. He's so faithful to us. We're not scared. I don't have time to be scared. You understand, if I'm scared, then I'm not able to enjoy what I'm put on this earth to do. I can't enjoy working for God or even enjoy my recreation if I'm scared. So I refuse to be scared. I've made a decision not to be scared, not to be scared of the media, not to be scared of the health authority, not to be scared of the neighbors that want to tell on me, not to be scared of you, not to be scared of the devil, not to be scared of losing everything, not to be scared of the IRS, not to be scared of nothing. And I enjoy my life a lot better because I ain't scared. The Bible warns us, the Bible warns us to be careful to not get sucked in, to not get sucked in to having our desires here on earth. The Bible tells us don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal because wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also, can I, can I tell you something? You can't take none of this stuff to heaven with you. And neither can I. I'll tell you what you do get to take. The souls that got saved because Jesus used you. You, you, you get to take those to heaven with you. 
Paul said, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. 1 Corinthians 2.9. Jesus told us in John 14 too that there is more than enough room in my father's house. He said, if it weren't so, I would have told you. And he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. The Bible tells us there will be a new heaven and new earth. And here's some scriptures you can write down. Isaiah 65, 17. Isaiah 66, 22. And 2 Peter 3, 13. Revelation 21, verse 1 through 8. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. And the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them and he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain, all of these are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Amen. Now, let me read verse 8. Verse 8 says, But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. So where is the power in the church? Why are we not seeing so many miracles? And I want to tell you what my answer is in speaking about the American church. is because of this. Cowardice has no power. Cowardice has no power. What is a coward exactly? I mean, we just read, it said cowards will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. A coward is someone who lacks the courage to do or endure dangerous or unpleasant things. Church, we have been trained to avoid everything unpleasant. The church doesn't do what it's supposed to do because it doesn't want to experience unpleasant things. Or unpleasant people. Avoiding conflict is cowardice. Looking for conflict is stupid. But avoiding what you are supposed to defeat is cowardice. The enemy desires for us to be a church of cowards. What feeds cowardice is comfort and complacency. Fear will make you a coward because you are afraid of leaving comfort and a false sense of security because you don't want to be involved in the conflict. The fear of losing comfortability is creating cowards. Revelation 12, 11, They did not love their lives even unto death. The greatest thing that we can all learn is to live willing to really lose everything, to gain everything in Christ. To love Christ more than our comforts. We have been bowing down to the God of comfortable. We have looked at people who commit abortion people who worship idols, people who practice sorcery and Wiccan and witchcraft, we've looked at them like they are the higher degree sinner. Well, God puts cowards in the same 
box as in. There's too much cowardice because we don't want to be made fun of. We don't want to have our jobs threatened. We don't want family members to be mad at us. We don't stand up for what's right. We don't speak the truth. We run away from the conflict. And we say, I'm just being a peacemaker. Oh, blessed are the peacemakers. I'm just being a peacemaker. Avoiding conflict does not make you a peacemaker. It makes you a coward. When conflict's in front of you, you deal with it, but you deal with it like Jesus. You deal with it like Jesus. Oh, please don't deal with it like Alpha. Please don't do that. Don't, don't deal with it like Alpha. Don't deal with it like Keith either. <laughs> don't deal with it like Yelena. Uh-uh. Don't. No. Don't do that. No. Don't deal with it like Joanne. Pastor Jorge, definitely don't deal with it like him. No. You deal with it like Jesus. We are not supposed to run from conflict. Listen, conflict is something that the church has been experiencing ever since it was born. Ever since it was created, conflict has been at the door, has been in the house. We're not supposed to run from it. Philippians 1, 20 through 21 says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have, completed, have complete boldness so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. You have to live willing to lose everything now so you can gain everything in Christ. That's how we're supposed to live. There's a a right way and a wrong way to handle conflict. And something that we all have to learn to do is we need to learn how to manage conflict every day. There's different conflicts. There's family stuff, work stuff, physical stuff, spiritual stuff. There's different conflicts all the time, and there's a healthy way to deal with it. And I'll tell you a secret. Your flesh is never going to deal with it correctly. But through the Spirit, we can. I, I, get, I get super upset, and I'm, I'm closing right now, so just, just so you know. I know y'all are like, land the plane, it's time to go, time to eat. I got you. I get really upset, like something that pushes my button, pulls my trigger, whatever you want to call it, is when um, people say things about me that aren't true. When people try to uh, come against my character or my integrity, and, and say things. And uh, when they're spreading rumors about me, false testimony, man, I, I get worked up. And uh, sometimes I want to deal with it with my own hands, literally. And I want to do it my own way. But you know what the Lord has instructed me over the years? To keep my mouth shut. He's told me to watch my mouth. And you know what? My mom and my grandma has been telling me the same thing for years. Watch your mouth. You know what? They're right. And you know, the Lord has promised me that he will take care of what needs to be taken care of if I will trust him to it and watch my mouth. Now, when I get around some of my close personal friends, I will vent. You know, to my wife, sometimes I will vent. And I will say how I feel, but I won't react and do what I want to do. And I think it's healthy to have trusted people in your life that you can vent to. And sometimes I vent in a way that if you walked by with the window open, you would be like, is he saved? You know what I mean? <laughs> is it okay if I'm real about it? I know some of y'all don't want to get real about it like that, but this is who, this is who I am, okay? And then I'll, you know, I'll have to listen to the Lord, and he'll say, you know, um, you need to get your heart right. If you want me to take care of this, you need to get your heart right. I'll be like, all right, Lord, I'm sorry. So put it in your hands, Lord. 
You see, there's a right way and a wrong way to deal with conflict. Sometimes the fact that you want to say something so bad is a confirmation that you shouldn't say anything at all. <laughs> and can I tell you the opposite? For those of you who like to shrink back, sometimes you're supposed to say something. But let God give you the words to speak. If God doesn't give you the words to speak, hold your tongue. Wait until he gives you the words. Wait until the Holy Spirit is nudging you and you're like, okay, I'm being pushed by the Holy Spirit. I got to deal with this. Wait. <laughs> I, hate, I hate that word too. That's like a cuss word to me. What? What did you just say to me? Wait. But you got to wait. You got to wait. And when you know that it's the Lord, then you do what the Lord says to do. Would you stand with me and we'll pray together? Okay, I want everybody, honestly, I want everybody to go to heaven. All of you need to go there. I hear it's the greatest place ever, and Jesus has made a way for all of us to be there. Okay? Is there anybody here today, right now, that you don't know if you're going to heaven? Because we as a church, we want to pray with you. We want to make sure that nobody's going to be left behind. Is there anybody that wants a relationship with Jesus Christ, you want him to be your Lord and Savior, and you want to be saved? Lift your hand. Let's pray right now. Everybody needs to go to heaven, okay? All right? Is there everybody? Okay? Okay? All right. Will you help me? We're going to pray together as a church. We're going to make sure everybody is going to be with the Father. Amen? So let's pray right now. Lord Jesus, forgive me of all my sin. You are my Lord and Savior. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. And I believe that you died and rose again. And that you love me. And I receive your forgiveness today. I receive your Lordship today. And I receive your love today. Come and change me and make me who you created me to be. Hold right now, because I can't do it without you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. I want to pray for you as a church. I want to pray for all of us right now. And before you go today, if you made a decision to walk with Jesus, we need to know about it. We want to make sure that you get plugged in and you're not walking alone, okay? Fill out a card, send us an email, however you want to do it. Just make sure we know, all right? Father, I ask for your blessing upon the church. I ask, God, that the words that were spoken today, everything that came out of the living word of God, we would not forget. Help us to live each day driven by eternity. Help us to live each day wanting lost souls to be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you guys, and thank you so much for being here. Hopefully we will see you again next week. Okay, you won't see me, because Pastor Abraham will be here preaching next week. That's going to be good. Okay, and the next week you won't see me, because I'll still be in Costa Rica. Brother Jeff Hayes is going to be preaching. All right, and you guys are going to enjoy him as well. All right, take care, and God bless you guys.